Hi, I'm artist Lillian Gray and I love teaching art history. Today's lesson is all about South African artist William Kentridge. William Kentridge is a South African artist best known for his charcoal drawings, animations, bookmaking, puppetry, theatre productions, tapestries and films. He is a prolific artist that has been actively making art for over three and a half decades. In essence, he works with quite a restrictive medium, using only charcoal and here and there a touch of blue and red. He has created animations of astounding depth. The political content and unique techniques of Kentridge's work have propelled him into the realm of South Africa's top artists. He is South Africa's most successful living artist and holds the record for the most expensive drawing ever sold by a South African artist. This typewriter set sold for more than 13 million rand. Kentridge's bold artistic vision has made him one of the world's most sought-after artists by museums and collectors alike. His work can be found in some of the most prestigious museums globally, including the MoMA in New York, the Tate Modern in London, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. He has even exhibited in the Louvre in Paris. Kentridge also boasts of an array of awards. Other career highlights include reaching the Time 100 in 2009, lectures at Harvard University, and his art has even been shown in Times Square. Let's delve a little deeper into Kentridge's life and the symbolism behind his massive collection of artworks. William Kentridge was born in 1955, Johannesburg, South Africa, into a Jewish family. Both Kentridge's parents were lawyers. 1955 is the early days of the apartheid system in South Africa. Apartheid means separateness. Apartheid was a system that separated people by race into four racial categories to be exact. White people, colored people, black people and Asians. This system was unfair because it prioritized white people's rights above all the other races, so they were more privileged. In 1959, the parliament passed new laws extending racial segregation by creating separate homelands for South Africa's major black groups. The media, such as TV and newspapers, were state-controlled and censored. Many white people didn't witness all the horrors that occurred in the townships. Kentridge's parents, Sydney and Felicia Kentridge, were both advocates. They specialized in representing people oppressed by the apartheid system. His father and mother played a leading role in a number of the most significant political trials in apartheid-era South Africa, including the treason trial of Nelson Mandela and the 1978 inquest into the death of Steve Biko. His parents' dedication to the fight against apartheid in South Africa would have a lasting impact on the artist, setting him apart from many of his white peers from a young age and heavily informing his work. In 1960, black protest against apartheid reached a turning point when police killed 69 people in the Sharpeville massacre. Kentridge was six years old when he was poking around in his father's office. His eyes focused on a beautiful yellow Kodak box. It looked like a chocolate box to young little Kentridge. He was shocked and horrified when he peered inside. These were photos of the Sharpeville massacre. His father was using it as evidence for the trial. This box forced Kentridge to see the atrocities that the apartheid system created. He was no longer sheltered or innocent. Kentridge became a witness to people's suffering and pain, a third-party observer. He has spent his life and career re-examining South Africa's recent history. This yellow box became a symbol to him of South Africa's tragic history. Kentridge enjoyed an excellent education as a child. His parents also often read Greek mythology and classical literature to him. He also attended art lessons and developed a love for drawing. However, with all his talents and exposure, Kentridge had difficulty in finding the proper vocation. He left school and did a degree in politics and African studies at the University of Witwatersrand. Then he did a diploma in fine arts from the Johannesburg Art Foundation. Kentridge loved drawing and he loved acting, but he was also drawn to politics. Kentridge dabbled with both art and acting until one day someone said to him, You have to specialize. You need to decide between drawing and acting. You cannot do both. If you do both, you will remain an amateur for the rest of your life. After hearing this advice, he closed his art studio. He kept on hearing a small inner voice saying to him, You do not have the right to be an artist. So he sold his etching press and art supplies and set off to study mime and theater in Paris. After three weeks, he discovered 
but he wasn't a great actor. Kentridge felt deflated and miserable. If he wasn't an actor, nor an artist, what was he? So he tried to become a filmmaker. And then he failed at that also. So he failed at painting, failed at acting, failed at filmmaking. So what was he? At the age of 30, he went back to his love for drawing. And he thought to himself, Okay, I'll do this until I find my real job. And he told his one friend, I'm looking for a real job. And one day I will end up working for a building society or in a bank. A good friend walked up to Kentridge, touched him on the shoulder and said to him, You understand you are now 30. No one will give you a job. You are unemployable. Stop having this illusion that you will find another life. Drown or swim, but accept that you are an artist. And finally, Kentridge realized he was all the things. He was someone that loved drawing, did theater, made movies, loved politics and the law. He didn't have to choose. He could be all of it. He started blurring all the boundaries between these different mediums. Kentridge always says that his failures rescued him. If he was a slightly better actor, he might have ended up sticking with acting, playing the third swordsman in a play and never the lead role. Today he is grateful that he wasn't excellent at painting, acting and filmmaking because it ultimately led him to the fusion of genres he is known for today. Kentridge has developed a unique method by combining all his interests with his famous charcoal animations. In the studio, Kentridge puts a large sheet of paper on the wall. He then places a camera four paces away. He draws on the sheet of paper, walks to the camera and takes a photo. Click! He walks back to the paper makes a slight change to the drawing, erasing and adding to the image. He walks back to the camera, takes another photo. Click! And so he repeats this loop over and over, painstakingly working on the same piece of paper. He then edits all the photos in sequence and creates a moving image. Each photo of the drawing receives a quarter of a second to two seconds screen time. A single drawing is altered and filmed this way until the end of a scene. This process is unique since traditional animations are usually done with one drawing per paper, creating thousands of drawings. Kentridge only draws on one sheet of paper. He can do up to 100 alterations per page. He can do this because charcoal erases easily. He can change it as quickly as he can think. This method is primitive and crude and gives his animation movies a jagged sense of movement, a vintage grainy feeling and creates uneasiness. It takes several weeks to make a minute and 10 months to make a 9 minute film. His technique is more about making a drawing than a film. Kendrich then proceeds to add music to the animation and in some cases, dialogue. A question I often get asked when teaching a lesson on Kentridge is, if he makes movies and they are mainly free to watch, then how does he make money with his art? What does he sell in the galleries? The last alteration of an image marks the end of a specific scene in his films. Not the end of the film, but rather the end of that specific scenario. He then takes this last drawing, frames it, and displays it in the gallery with the film as a finished art piece. Kentridge has a cohesive visual language that he has developed over the years. We can almost instantly recognize a William Kentridge artwork. Suppose one artwork is a word. A series of artworks, such as an exhibition, is a sentence. Then a body of work over the years would be an essay or a book. This to me is a lovely analogy and so relevant to Kentridge's artworks. To truly understand Kentridge's works, you need to look at his entire body of work over three decades. His work is filled with complex narratives and layers and layers of meaning. He uses metaphors, symbols, references to famous artworks, philosophy and politics in his work. Let's look at key themes in his artworks and how he developed his visual language. Kentridge uses a cohesive color scheme. His artworks are predominantly black and white, done in charcoal or sometimes Indian ink. He also sometimes plays with inverted images where he makes the background black and uses white lines. Kentridge's artwork done before 1994 is classified as resistance art and mainly comments on apartheid and the society it created. In these resistance artworks, the stark contrast between black and white can be seen as the contrast between the races in South Africa. Two artists that has influenced Kendrick's monochromatic work is Dumili Feni and John Mafangejo. Kendrick also uses a dash of red and blue in some of his artworks. Red symbolizes blood, wounds, death and violence. 
The dark red blood flowing out from the old wounds of the unknown corpse is a silent narrative of South Africa's violent history. Blue is associated with peace, waiting, hope, retrospection, and sorrowfulness. Blue water can also symbolize redemption and hope. A key aspect to Kendrick's work is that the surface has memory. Even though charcoal is easy to erase, you can never fully erase it. Charcoal's residue gets lodged into the fibers of the page, leaving smudges and ghost images. The filming process records the changes of the drawing, but the streaks that remain keep the history of the drawing. It creates a sense of fading memory or the passing of time. This toys with the idea of how we can never really erase the past. As humans, we will always be haunted by the past. It also symbolizes how a landscape can absorb a historical event, only leaving vague traces. The ghost images are very relevant to South Africa's history of how the apartheid regime tried to erase and hide the violence of apartheid, but ultimately failed. It brings to mind George Santayana's often quoted phrase, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The process can also refer to the unreliability of our memories. Each time we recall a memory, we view it with our modern lenses and slightly alter and change the memory. Our memories are inconsistent, fragile and unreliable. Then there is a transformation into the new South Africa, which has within it the idea of painting over the old, of disremembering. Kendrich uses symbols as part of his visual language. He uses the same symbols repeatedly throughout his various artworks. The megaphone that often appears as part of his iconography was inspired by seeing Lenin using a megaphone. A megaphone is also an object that has become iconic in resistance art images. In Kentridge's work, the megaphone may stand as a symbol of faceless power and dictatorship, or may simply represent the artist's voice. Reoccurring symbols in Kentridge's artwork and films are devices used to communicate, convey a message, or play music with. These include objects such as a megaphone, typewriter, telephone, telegram, overhead power lines, a film camera, newspapers, billboards, books, and metronomes. Kentridge is also fond of items used in navigation. These include the sextet, telescope, stars, lead line, maps, compass, quadrant, and astrolabe. Another critical aspect of Kentridge's work is duality. Kentridge's entire life is filled with contradictions. He has spent 40 years under apartheid rule and almost 30 years without it. Kentridge's early artworks, such as Conservationist's Ball and The Boating Party, focuses on the duality of society in apartheid South Africa. But Kentridge delves deeper and shows the duality within each of us, our dark side and light side. Here he plays with the duality of the artist, the artist as the creator and the artist as the viewer. Kentridge often inserts himself into his artworks. Autobiographical works are by nature subjective. Kentridge's works are very personal and are often inspired by his own experiences. He often depicts a scene from an autobiographical point of view. He bases characters on himself. Both Felix and Soho, central characters to his films, are drawn on his own self-image. He plays both the rich landlord and the deserted Felix. This could depict Kentridge's own inner battle and duality of man. The two men are often fighting each other, one naked and the other clothed. Kentridge is also an actor in his own live action movies. He is playing opposing roles, motives and interests. Here he acts as both the interviewer and the interviewee. Animation literally means to bring to life by adding movement. Kendrick is not only fond of movement, but loves metamorphosis, changing one object into something completely different. He uses metamorphosis to connect different events, plots and images, which joins other scenes of time and space. Because Kendrick studied theatre and filmmaking, he has a love for the history of film. This has led him to a passion for the technologies of looking, technology that is mostly obsolete today. If we understand how the brain and the eyes work together to create a sense of depth, we can trick the eye. We can create an illusion of movement and depth that isn't truly there. Devices that play with our perception of movement and depth are called pre-cinematic tools. These include the stereoscope, the phenakistoscope, the zoetrope, the anamorphic mirror and the clawed glass. These are all machines for creating illusions and are often referenced in Kendrick's work. Kendrick also uses other objects used for viewing, like the X-ray, the MRI, and the CAT scan. All of these devices refer to our different ways of seeing. We all look at the world differently. We all have glasses with which we view the world. 
but they also offer the artist different ways to represent the world to us. Kendridge is fascinated by how humans find meaning, develop understanding, and their thought process. He avoids too much structure in his work and enjoys creating freely. Therefore, he does not work with a storyboard or a script. Instead, a film or an artwork usually starts with a deep desire to draw. He will then start drawing and develop ideas as he walks back and forth between the camera and the paper. Constantly changing ideas and trusting the process of creating. Discovering what the next drawing will be by following the natural flow of his creativity. He says this process is developed because he cannot write a story or develop a script. But it also mimics how we as humans learn in the real world. We have experiences and then we take these fragments and make sense of the world around us. We are not given a set of instructions on how to live life. Instead, it is a process of unfolding, a process of discovery. Life is filled with ambiguity, contradictions and open endings, incomplete movements, and so is Kentridge's art and films. Uncertainty is key. Uncertainty is much closer to how the world is. Kentridge's works often create a restless, uneasy feeling in the viewer and often depicts uncomfortable situations. His artwork is about finding meaning in a world of uncertainty and change. There are various main characters who are repeated throughout Kentridge's films. The two most important characters are Soho Eckstein, a Johannesburg industrialist and mine landlord, and Felix Tintelbaum, who is a sensitive poetic type and an artist. While Soho and Felix are drawn as separate characters, they represent different sides of the same person. Many of the characters in Kentridge's films become symbolic representations. So, Eckstein symbolizes an apartheid vision of South Africa and the darker side in all of us. Another character is Nandi, who often draws the viewer's attention to the plight of the poor and the oppressed. Kendrick's birthplace, Johannesburg, plays a crucial role in his artwork. It becomes one of the key characters in his films. He places all his symbols and characters inside the Johannesburg landscape. Kendrick has lived in Johannesburg all his life. Johannesburg is a strange, unnatural city. The city lacks a geographic marker. It has no sea, mountains, nor big rivers or water bodies. Yet it is one of the largest cities in Africa and South Africa's largest city. The city has a prehistoric history. Fast forward and not a lot has happened since in this particular landscape. The actual city was only formed in 1886 when they discovered gold. It attracted hundreds of diggers and fortune seekers. For the first 30 years, it was the fastest growing city in the world. Miners lived in the hostels with poor sanitation and appalling living conditions. As the miners dug up the earth, mine carts dumped it above ground, forming yellow hills. The yellow colour was from the cyanide in the ground. This created a very unnatural landscape, and dust storms started to plague the rich landlords. They made it their mission to plant trees in Johannesburg and create the rich leafy suburbs. Today, Johannesburg is the world's largest man-made forest with over 10 million trees. The suburbs are leafy green in contrast to the grasslands on the outskirts of Joburg. The end of the suburb marks the end of the irrigation and privilege. This creates a stark contrast between the wealthy and the poor. Johannesburg thus represents an unnatural life to Kentridge. He is constantly aware that the city is outside of nature. The natural vegetation of Johannesburg was grasslands known as the high felt. The high felt grasslands that have remained are burnt once a year in the dry season to prepare the land for new growth. The scorched earth becomes a charcoal drawing itself. Kentridge often plays with the dualities Johannesburg represent in his artworks. He portrays with the picturesque state of living that white people enjoyed during apartheid and the oppressive militant place it was for black people. He constantly plays with the city as a place where the duality of man is exposed. This brings me to the theme of water in Kentridge's work. Water is often seen in taps, basins, baths, washing, rinsing, shaving and flooding in Kentridge's work. This is also closely linked to Johannesburg. Johannesburg is no water above ground, but too much water below ground. When mining started, they had to get rid of the water filling the mine shaft and continuously pumped it out. These created sinus-like cavities in the earth, which caused the land to become unstable. It often created sinkholes and minor shakes. Kentridge recalls teacups shaking in their house and sinkholes forming in the roads right before him as a child. He sees this as a message from down below. While white people lived in luxury above ground, armies of miners were suffering and working below ground. 
the tremors can be seen as symptoms of an unnatural relationship with nature and the abnormal segregation between different races. Water becomes both a wish and a threat. A wish to irrigate the wealthy suburbs and a threat to the mines and the stability of the situation and the landscape. Johannesburg used to be surrounded by mine dumps, but lately all the golden hills have slowly vanished. This is due to a new technology that allowed mining companies to rework the ground that was dumped and extract even more gold from it. Slowly they extracted the gold from the dumps and tossed the ground back down the old mine shafts. It fascinated Kentridge how the landscape changes over time. He says that the landscape is not a reliable witness to history. For example, when we pass a specific area where a major historical battle occurred, we can hardly see any traces of the atrocities that occurred there. Maybe where there is a mass grave, the trees will be slightly shorter than other trees surrounding them. We need to dig up the landscape for clues and analyze the layers and layers to see the history of a place. He often plays with the idea that the land can cover and erase the past in his artworks and films. Kentridge often uses various wild beasts in his artworks, such as the hyena, the panther, the cheetah, the warthog, and the rhino. The symbolism of hyenas in South Africa is associated with evil, dark spirits, and mischief. It becomes a prominent symbol in resistance art in South Africa. An animal Kentridge is fascinated explicitly by is the rhino. He is attracted to the sheer mass and strength of the rhino. Despite its weight, it has the freedom of movement, gracefulness, and playfulness. But the fascination with the rhino and symbolism goes much deeper. Kendrick sees the rhino as a symbol of the destruction caused by colonialism. It also depicts ignorance towards Africa and represents the other. Two artworks that have really influenced the meaning of the rhino behind Kendrick's work is Albrecht Dürer, the woodcut print, in 1515, and a painting by Pietro Longhi, Clara, the rhinoceros, created in 1751. In short, Dürer has never seen a rhino in real life and created this image based on what others have seen. Due to this, the woodcut is not an entirely accurate representation of a rhinoceros. He depicts an animal with hard armor-like plates with rivets holding them together at the edges. The rhino has an additional horn and scaly legs. None of these features is present in a real rhinoceros. Despite its anatomical inaccuracies, Dürer's woodcut became very popular in Europe and was copied many times in the following three centuries. Westerners regarded it as an accurate representation of the rhinoceros into the late 18th century. Eventually, it was supplanted by a more realistic drawing and painting, particularly Clara the Rhinoceros by Piero Longhini in 1751. In Pietro's painting, we see the rhinoceros at a carnival in Venice. Now this rhinoceros was Clara, a celebrated rhino that was taken on tour of Europe between 1741 and 1751. The picture is strange indeed. We see five men and two women and a child observing the rhino. The horn is cut off and held by one of the men in the front. The power of the rhino is transferred from the rhino to this man. By naming the rhino Clara, she sounds like a family member. Yet there is a barrier between the people and the beast. Because of these artworks, the rhino to Kentridge symbolizes Europe's misunderstanding of Africa. It also illustrates how Europe has taken Africa's power and treasures. The rhino also represents the other. We are both attracted and repelled by the rhino's otherness. Today, rhinoceros are almost extinct because man still covered their power. The compressed hair of its horn is ground up to make aphrodisiacs and other medicines. Armed gangs with AK-47s and axes hunt rhinos and sell them to the Asian market. Man's obsession for power will stop at nothing. Even possible extinction is not sufficient warning. Kendridge often plays with the concept of time in his work. Back in 1850, when photography was invented, the process was slow. A photo's slow development time caused sitters to sit still for a long time and not move to capture the image. The photograph becomes thick with time. Kentridge loves referencing this in his works. He adds layers and layers to one drawing to make it thick with time. When he holds a roll of film, he is holding a certain amount of time. Kentridge often also toys with a reversal of time in his films. When he films himself throwing books around in his studio, it becomes an act of chaos. When he plays that same footage in reverse, chaos becomes order. Kentridge also often makes reference to famous paintings in his work. These include Goya, Poisson, Turner, Watteau, and Renoir. 
He has particularly been inspired by Goya's 3rd of May, Giotto's Massacre of the Innocents, and Titian's Flaying of Marsyas. We can see how these works influence Kentridge by the way he also depicts his victims of violence. He often draws stacked bodies, fragments of bodies, or bodies that are stretched out. Kentridge's most famous reference to a famous painting is his triptych The Boating Party, created in 1985. This is based on Renoir's painting of a similar name. In contrast to Renoir's artwork, Kentridge's work is a work of violence and a severe comment on the state of South Africa during apartheid. Kentridge also often combines written text into his artwork. He prints or paints directly onto discarded pages of text. He is also known for turning old books into sketchbooks. This is due to the Dada art movement's influence on Kentridge's artwork. The Dada artists often included text and automatic writing into their artworks. Theatre has a massive impact on Kentridge's work. He is often combining art on stage backdrops, inserting actors into his artworks, or dressing actors as art pieces. Some of his artworks take the shape of an actual little mini theater that he builds and films in his studio. That concludes some of the major themes in Kentridge's artworks. And as I said previously, his artworks are extremely complex with layers and layers of meaning. So it's impossible for me to cover all the themes in this video. Let's move on to the various phases of Kentridge's art career. Kentridge has a long art career spanning over three decades. His work is generally divided into two parts. All work done prior to 1994 is classified as resistance art. All work done after 1994 is classified as multimedia artworks or new media. The date 1994 is significant because it marked the end of apartheid in South Africa. 1919, Nelson Mandela was released from prison and in 1994, Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as the president of South Africa. And this marked the beginning of the new South Africa. So why is Kentridge's artwork so important and why should we study them today? Kentridge is one of the most thoughtful and engaging artists of his generation. There are only a handful of artists in a lifetime whose work will stop you dead in your tracks and make you think and feel differently. His work speaks to a universal audience, even though he addresses complex themes specific to South Africa's racial discrimination and apartheid history. Kentridge's work dares to underscore the essential ways in which biography and history, national identity and colonialism could be investigated through the visual arts. Due to the complicated narratives and layers of meaning in Kentridge's artwork, we have decided to extend this video by adding two additional videos. Please stay tuned for an in-depth analysis of some of his most important resistance artworks done prior to 1994, as well as another video analyzing his new multimedia work done after 1994. Now that you understand some of the key themes in Kendrick's artwork, just enjoy watching this compilation and see if you can spot some of the deeper meanings, narratives and symbols in his work.